Amen. Well, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we look eager for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies into the likeness of his glorious body. And that day is coming soon, but you know, it's not here yet. And uh, if you are a covenant theologian, you are given to a doctrine known as amillennialism, which states that the kingdom is here now. Well, if this is the kingdom, um, I don't know. I, if I was living in Paris, I certainly wouldn't want to think the kingdom is here now. Um, that, that, that doctrine has, uh, leaves a lot to be desired, I think. So our hearts can go out to those uh, in Paris who have suffered greatly. And uh, we are reminded, as Pastor said, that, you know, this is kind of here. California or anywhere. Uh, this is a world that is that lies in the wicked one, as it says in First John. Uh, and it is dominated by the wicked one. And increasingly, uh, a religion that was inspired by the wicked one is dominating more and more of the world. And uh, we're seeing that on a daily basis, just in an amazing way. Well, we want to give our attention to some better things this morning. So we want to turn our attention back to our study on dispensationalism. We're going to be looking at um, uh, others besides just co covenant theologians who are confused about the kingdom this morning as well. And uh, this morning's uh, lesson is entitled, What Different Views Claim to Be Dispensationalism? Well, uh, in the past what we've been doing is largely drawing a contrast between dispensationalism and covenant theology. But as we've done that, we've noted that within covenant theology, there are uh, different approaches. In fact, there are differences within covenant theology. The same can be said about dispensationalism. Within the broad camp labeled dispensationalism, there are different views. Okay, so within covenant theology, we saw, for example, there are some who hold two covenants, some who hold three covenants. Yeah, the differences of opinion there within covenant theology. Uh, there are some in covenant theology who take one view of the relationship of the Mosaic law to the covenant of grace. Others take a slightly different view of that. So there are differences. Covenant theology is not a, you know, a monolithic uh, encampment, as some of us might tend to think. Uh, you know, within covenant theology, some who are amillennial, some who are postmillennial, some who are premillennial. So you've got these differences. Well, likewise, in our camp, in dispensationalism, there are some differing views. <clears throat> and uh, we want to take a look at a couple of those. The two most commonly uh, known variations within dispensationalism are ultra-dispensationalism and progressive dispensationalism. And I want to try to <coughs> define those uh, positions for you. I haven't encountered very many out here in the West that are ultra-dispensationalist. I've, I've met a few, and I've talked with them. Uh, this is not a real common view. The second one that we'll look at, progressive dispensationalism, is more common. And uh, we're, we're coming across this increasingly. And I want to define these terms so that you can um, detect them when you come across them, so that you know what they teach and what their shortcomings are. Ultra-dispensationalism uh, was first developed by a great biblical scholar named Ethelbert W. Bullinger. Now, um, you need to be careful when you're talking about uh, famous um, theologians of the past that you do not confuse Ethelbert W. Bullinger with another famous Bullinger, Heinrich Bullinger. Heinrich Bullinger was a, a great theologian of the Reformation era. In fact, he was personally known by John Calvin. They had, they had discussions with one another in the development of Calvinism. A Heinrich Bullinger is not the same as E.W. Bullinger. They live a couple hundred years apart. Okay, E.W. Bullinger is the one that we're going to be talking about. And um, uh, so for the remainder of this time, as I'm talking about Bullinger, I'm talking about E.W. Bullinger, okay? not Heinrich Bullinger. And uh, they, they had very, very different approaches. Heinrich Bullinger definitely was, was reformed. Covenant theology uh, in that camp very much 
E. W. Bullinger was very much a dispensationalist, but he was a confused dispensationalist. I'll tell you why. Um, he started out uh, becoming very impressed with the teachings of early dispensationalists like John Darby and some of the others. And uh, so he eagerly read uh, the things that, that, that they were teaching about. He became very interested in the study of end times and prophecy. In fact, for many years, E.W. Bollinger was the editor-in-chief of a, a uh, journal titled Things to Come. And he was, uh, he was very much given to the study of the scriptures. And in many ways was a, a, a good scholar, a good exegete for the scriptures. Uh, one of the books that he has written that is still used in many Bible colleges and seminaries today is his book, Figures of Speech, used in the Bible, which is an exhaustive compendium of all the different figures of speech found in the Bible with a definition of each one, examples given, uh, still a very valuable book today, and one that I have that I use from time to time, and I, I recommend it to students, but when I do, I caution them about who E.W. Bullinger is. So this particular book of his was quite good. Another book that he read, however, which really illustrates some of the problems with Bullinger, was uh, his book, Number in Scripture in which he elaborates a very uh, complex and complicated system of numerology. Now, numerology is the belief that numbers used in scripture have um, deep, kind of hidden, symbolic meaning. Now, to be sure, there are some numbers in scripture that are used with a kind of symbolic significance. There are times when numbers like one speaks of the unity of God, or three maybe speaks Trinity of God, the numbers 7 and 12 are used with great significance in Scripture. We know that, we recognize that, we see that from place to place in Scripture. But what Bollinger did was he took this concept of, um, of kind of mystical significance of numbers and expanded it to include pretty much any time a number was used in Scripture, he sought to find some hidden meaning behind that number. And so his book, Number in Scripture, puts forth this extravagant system. He has 44 chapters in this book. Each one is devoted to the spiritual significance of a specific number or a combination of numbers. And so um, this is, I think, taking numerology to, a, to an excess beyond what is legitimate. And so while we recognize there are some significant numbers, um, you can very easily do that away from the literal interpretation of scripture when you get caught up in numerology as E.W. Bollinger did. But for the most part, he was interested in the literal interpretation of scripture, although he did get carried away with numerology, and another area that he got carried away with was typology. Now again, there are there is legitimate typology in the scriptures. There are people, events, um, and things in scripture in the Old Testament to point forward to some New Testament uh, event or person or, or thing. For example, the author of Hebrews makes much of the typology of the tabernacle and the various parts of the tabernacle. But Bollinger got so carried away with typology that I mean, you could almost say every tent peg in the tabernacle represented some spiritual truth for Bollinger. Uh, he just, you know, he started with something that was good and tended to take them to excess. And so uh, this is developed in another book of his, How to Enjoy the Bible, where he develops 12 principles of understanding God's Word. Um, much of it is good. Much of this book is, is quite sound and deals with uh, literal interpretation. But again, when he gets into typology and numerology, he takes things to an excess. So this is uh, this is E. W. Bollinger that we're talking about. He is really the founder of this one uh, form of dispensationalism known as ultra dispensationalism. His ultra dispensationalism really derives from his unique view that the church did not begin on the day of Pentecost, but rather um, with the teaching of the Apostle Paul. 
And for Bollinger, the church really does not begin until after the end of the book of Acts, after Paul's imprisonment in Rome. And uh, so for Bollinger, as we will see, uh, he believes the only books of the Bible that really relate or pertain directly to the church are Paul's prison epistles. Uh, and he, he derived that really from his understanding of this passage in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Well, let's take a look at this passage. And it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the book of Ephesians. It's one of the prison epistles. Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus during his prison imprisonment in Rome. So Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are the prison epistles. Um, so this is why Paul refers to himself as the prisoner of Christ Jesus here in verse 1. For the sake of the Gentiles, verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation, there was made known to me, Paul says, the mystery. As I wrote before in brief, by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it's now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. And what is this mystery? It was made known to Paul, verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the work of his power. But basically, what, what uh, Paul is saying is the mystery of the truth of the church, that there would be a body in which Jew and Gentile are joined together in one body, was a mystery not revealed in past generations but was made known personally to Paul. So, uh, Bollinger says, therefore, the church did not come into existence until it was revealed to Paul. And Paul first starts talking about this in the prison epistles, and so he concluded that it was not revealed earlier in Paul, it wasn't revealed until sometime during his um, imprisonment in Rome. That's when the church really came into existence. So as we, as we try to relate this to what we've learned already, what we've seen uh, in earlier lessons, and we know that the Bible teaches the church did come into existence on the day of Pentecost. Okay? The law continued until the cross. The cross was the end of the law. Christ nailed the law to the cross, taking it out of the way. That was when the, 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 the relevancy and the rule of the Mosaic Law came to an end. It's the end of that dispensation. The church begins on the day of Pentecost. The beginning of the church is directly related to the ministry of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was never, never in existence before the day of Pentecost. Once the baptism of the Holy Spirit begins, it's that people are being added to the church. That all starts on Pentecost. So we have the law until the cross. Pentecost begins the church. And that's how we go. Bollinger says no. Bollinger says um, the church did not begin immediately on Pentecost, but rather in the days after Pentecost, or after the cross, there was a, a, a kind of continuation of the law until God makes known to Paul the revelation of the church. And so for Bollinger, the church begins um, after the end of the book of Acts. In part, this is due to Bollinger's attempt to try to make sense out of books like the book of James. So he reads James. James seems to be a variance with Paul. James appears to be written to people under the law. And so he says in the early days after Pentecost, there was like an extension. There were believers in Jesus. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But Bollinger said this was a, 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 a Jewish belief in Christ. And there are other implications to what uh, Bollinger taught about this that we'll go into in just a moment. Now, uh, since the time of Bollinger, there have been other ultra dispensations that modified his position a little bit. Some say, well, yes, Bollinger was right in general, but he got the timing wrong. 
Some say that, well, uh, there, was, uh, there was a revelation made to Paul earlier than the end of Acts. And so some would say that uh, the church begins with the first missionary journey of Paul. Acts chapter 13, when Paul takes the gospel to the Gentiles. Then he begins talking to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles in, and he's talking about the equality of Jews and the Gentiles within the church. And this, of course, was wrapped up in uh, the consequence uh, in the second journey of the, uh, of the Council of Jerusalem. So with Paul's missionary journeys, some say the church begins. And then others would even bring it a little further forward, and some older dispensationalists would say the church begins with the salvation of Paul on the road to Damascus. So as we contrast this, the dispensational view, which we're looking at here, we can look at three different approaches taken by ultra dispensationalists. There are those who say that there was an extension of the law after the cross up until the time of Paul's conversion in Acts 9, that that's when the church begins. That's a mild ultra dispensational view. A second mild ultra dispensational view would put the beginning of the church with Paul's first missionary journey in Acts, that's in Acts 9, I should say Acts 13. And then the, the strict view of Bullinger actually puts it later at the time of Paul's imprisonment, Acts 28, 28 or at least sometime after Acts 28, 28. So the key defining element of ultra dispensationalism is this beginning of the church, sometimes subsequent to the day of Pentecost. So um, what this does is it impacts a number of things. One thing it impacts is which books of the New Testament are directly related to the church. And as I said, both of you wrestle with this matter of uh, books like the book of James, and maybe even the book of Hebrews, and some of the other epistles that were not written by Paul that seem to incorporate a lot of Jewish elements. But according to Bollinger, only the prison epistles are directly related to the church. And these would be the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. There are other books of the New Testament. He would say, um, we might read them for profit, but much like we read the Old Testament or the Gospels. So he would, he would certainly put uh, James, uh, Hebrews, First and 2 Peter, and the, even some of the earlier epistles of Paul, he would say, are not written to the church, but are written to this kind of extension of the law after the cross. Now, others who take a milder form of ultra dispensationalism would believe that most or all of Paul's epistles are uh, related to the church, but not those that are not written by Paul. So, ultra dispensationalism has this little bit of a problem in how they look at some of the non Pauline books of the New Testament. But specifically, the problems uh, related to ultra dispensationalism affect three areas of church belief and practice. And those three areas are water baptism, the Lord's Supper, and divine healing. So, um, if you have your notes going on the second page of those notes now, we want to see how uh, ultra dispensationalism first affects one's view of baptism. Of course, as Baptists, uh, baptism is very important to us as well. Uh, we believe that Christ's great commission given in Acts 28 was a commission for the entire church. When Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, immersing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I command and to blow up with you all with you to the end of the age. We believe that this command is our command. This was given to us as believers in Jesus Christ and that part of our work of evangelism and discipleship involves baptizing um, <clears throat> converts to Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And uh, most, uh, most Christians believe this, but ultra dispensationalists have a different view on this. Um, their view is that water baptism is a Jewish rite 
related to the ceremonial washings associated with Judaism. And it is true that immersions began in Judaism. If you travel to Israel today, you find all over the land of Israel in, uh, immersion tanks. They're called, uh, a single one is called a mikra. A mikra is an immersion tank. They have them. Uh, they were utilized by Jews in the first century uh, for, for a number of reasons. If you were a Gentile, you converted to Judaism. You went through a ceremonial washing. If you were already a Jew, you were going to present an offering to the temple before you could be cleansed and offer that offering, you went through a mikvah. If you were to get married before you were joined to your partner in marriage, you went through a mikvah for a ceremonial washing. They had baptisms actually for a number of things. And so um, the ultra dispensation was to say that baptisms are intimately connected with Judaism. And that Christ's command to baptize the, their followers was given to the disciples only for this period of time where you have this extension of the law before the church comes into existence. And the Bollinger's position was that Paul never speaks of baptism in the prison epistles. And that it had become irrelevant by that time. Of course, um, for dispensationalists like us who see the, the church beginning on the day of Pentecost, it's obvious that baptism was in fact practiced um, as a church ordinance in the early days of the church. We find that in Acts chapter 2. Uh, those who believed in Christ were baptized on that day. Thousands of them were baptized. Uh, we find uh, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, we find those uh, uh, who came to faith in Christ in Cornelius' household were baptized. A number of baptisms exist, but Bollinger would say those were all before church actually began. So if the church did not begin until well after the day of Pentecost, as maintained by ultra dispensationalists, then perhaps these earlier baptisms were simply Jewish washings. Of course, uh, for us, accepting that the church began on the day of Pentecost, uh, the examples from the early chapters of Acts. Uh, probably convince us that water baptism is a valid ordinance for the church today. Uh, and, and we, of course, believe that the church did believe on Pentecost. We've already established that in Lessons 2 and 6. We talked about the significance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the other ministries of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit, and the indwelling of the Spirit. These are things that are characteristic of the church. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church, he was pointing not to a time when he would reveal that truth to the Apostle Paul, but he was talking about uh, the day of Pentecost, when that those unique ministries of the Holy Spirit started. But even as we examine the life of the Apostle Paul, um, I think we can come to the conclusion that uh, baptism was significant for the church long before Paul's imprisonment. In fact, uh, well, Paul himself was baptized in Acts chapter 9 after came to faith in Christ and talks about him being immersed in baptism. So some of the milder forms of ultra dispensation was to have the church begin with the conversion of Paul would have a problem with this. And rightly so. Paul himself was baptized. Not only that, but the first Gentiles after the church in Acts chapter 10, after the conversion of Paul, were baptized. And that was the household of Cornelius. And then some of Paul's earliest converts were baptized. And he mentions the baptism of those who came to faith in Christ in Acts chapter 16, verses 15 to 33, Acts 18, 8, Acts 19, 5. And then in, even in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize any of you. And he says, oh, wait a minute, maybe I did baptize a few of you. And he mentions a few names of people that he baptized. But baptism was part of Paul's ministry as he was going around uh, preaching the gospel. So um, ultra dispensationalism, I think, ultimately has a real problem here that's a matter of water baptism. They all reject water baptism, and uh, in rejecting it, they are really rejecting Christ's part of a, a significant part of Christ's great commission. Now somebody might say, well, it's just a ceremony. Now what's the big deal? Well, don't forget that, that uh, Water baptism has significant symbolism built into it. 
And God kept Moses from entering into the promised land because he violated the symbolism of striking the rock. And because Moses struck the rock twice when he was told to strike it once, God said, therefore, you're not going to enter into the promised land. We might shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know, what, what's the big deal? This is a ceremony. That's a ceremonial thing. But by striking the rock twice, Moses was violating the typology that God intended through that, uh, that symbolism. Well, baptism is a similar thing. Baptism is, is significant. It identifies, it shows our identification with Christ and his death and his resurrection. And uh, that is a, a continually played out in the church in a very visible outward way, showing people these truths. And uh, to say that, that baptism is insignificant, I think, is a serious violation of what God has committed to the church. So that's the first area of doctrine and practice in the church that ultra dispensationalists have a problem. A uh, second area has to do with the Lord's Supper. Now, not all ultra dispensationalists uh, reject the Lord's Supper, but many of them do. Uh, Bollinger said uh, no Lord's Supper at all, because when you get to the present epistles, Paul doesn't talk about it. So he says the Lord's Supper was associated with Passover, and Passover is Jewish, and the, the celebration of the Lord's Supper was just part of this law extension. So Bollinger rejected um, the Lord's Supper for the church entirely. Now those who take a milder form of ultra dispensationalism do continue to accept the Lord's Supper. They do so on the basis that uh, Paul discusses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They say that 1 Corinthians is one of the Pauline letters, and so it's appropriate for the church. So what you find then with the two ordinances in ultra dispensationalists, some of them follow Bollinger, reject both of the ordinances of the church, both baptism and the Lord's Supper. Others, taking a milder strike, would reject baptism, but they would retain the Lord's Supper. In either case, you've got big problems. Of course, the rejection of the Lord's Supper is, is I think, a huge problem. And we are, we are commanded to observe this on a regular basis. And so we do so. Uh, the third area is kind of an interesting one. And that has to do with divine healing. Now, the background to this is simply that you know, what the Bible teaches about spiritual gifts has been controversial since the very early days of the church. As early as the second century, there arose a heretical group known as the Montanists. They weren't from the state of Montana. They were followers of a man named Montanus. And he lived in, uh, in the region that we go today as Turkey. And Montanus um, observed that the miraculous gifts, speaking in tongues, healings, and various miracles, had ceased. Uh, he, he acknowledged that. They have ceased. But he didn't think that, that, would, that it was appropriate. He thought that was a matter of unbelief and lack of faith. And so Montanus believed that these miraculous gifts of healing, prophecy, and tongues should be brought back. So he started a movement that was, uh, we might call it pre Pentecostal Pentecostalists. And they were, the, they were the first ones in the history of the church really to, to make a big deal out of these miraculous gifts. Uh, the Montanists were opposed by most of the church, and Montanus himself had other problems. He believed that he was the promised paraclete, uh, whom we know to be the Holy Spirit. He gathered around a band of uh, women, formed a, a choir, and sang praises to Montanus. And Montanus preached that the kingdom of God would be reestablished in Phrygia, in, uh, in Asia Minor which, of course, never happened. Uh, Montanism was uh, condemned as a, uh, as a heresy in a council in Phrygia in the second century, and it was it pretty much died away. Of all their work, there were resurgences of Montanism from time to time, and Montanism-like movements uh, in North Africa in the following centuries, and here and there throughout the history of the church. In modern times, however, um, it's, it's had a big resurgence with Pentecostalism, and later with the Charismatic Movement, and the Third Way Vineyard Movement. And more recently, we've seen, uh, interestingly enough, among the New Calvinists, 
focus on speaking in tongues and prophecy and some of these miraculous gifts. Interestingly, during the time of the Reformation, uh, there was an effort on the part of some to bring back these miraculous gifts. Both Luther and Calvin opposed um, uh, those spiritual gifts coming back. Uh, both Luther and Calvin were confronted by, by enthusiasts who wanted to have ongoing prophecy, miracles, and speaking in tongues as relevant gifts to the church, and they said, no way. That is unscriptural, it's a heresy, we'll have nothing to do with it. So it interests me today that these the new Calvinists or ardent followers of the Reformers um, oppose them on this point. And it's, it's something that I think is going to cause problems for that movement. Well, uh, the ultra-dispensationalists are cessationists. Like you and I, they, they do not believe that the gifts of prophecy, tongues, and healing are gifts that God is giving to the church today. Now that's not to say that we don't believe that God heals. Of course we believe God heals. He heals and answers the prayer. It's his sovereign obligation and, and we rejoice. And he oftentimes has healed people who pray for and we praise God for that. If God wanted to give somebody a gift of a language, he is certainly sovereign and powerful enough to do that. He can do that in his book. We're talking about gifts. We're talking about regular practices within the church by people who are carrying out ministries within the church. And um, so, with respect to that regular practice within the church, we are cessationists. We don't believe that that's what God is doing uh, today. And these things came to an end probably around the first century. And ultra dispensationalists share that. However, what they do is they kind of simplify the argument. <clears throat> For them, if the church does not begin until the end of Acts, that's a quite simple thing. Um, what you find in Acts is interesting. You find in the early chapters of Acts lots of miracles being done. And as the book of Acts continues, you find that the practice of miracles gradually diminishing to where you get to the end of the book of Acts and there are almost no miracles being done at all. And so for the ultra dispensationalists, the church doesn't begin until after the end of the book of Acts, and they say by then that they're done. They're just done. And so, um, that's it. So, uh, they have no place for divine healing at all. So these are the three crucial areas of doctrine and practice in the church that are directly affected by ultra-dispensationalism. So what can we say if we kind of evaluate ultra-dispensationalism uh, in a summary fashion? Well, we can say a couple of positive things. Uh, first of all, they do maintain a distinction between Israel and the church. And we credit them with that. That is, that is correct, and they're, they're right in that respect. And secondly, they, they take a very firm stand on the literal interpretation of the Bible, although at times they carry it to extremes in the areas of numerology and typology. But they, they do take a firm stand on the literal interpretation of the Bible. These are positive things we would say about ultra dispensation. But negatively, the problems are, number one, I think, a failure to distinguish God's administration from man's awareness of it. Now, when we say that the church began on the day of Pentecost, that is from God's perspective. That does not mean that all the believers in Christ were fully aware of all the changes that took place in the So, the fact that God the essence of the church and the nature of the church to Paul later doesn't mean that the church wasn't the church before God revealed it to Paul. There's a distinction between what God is doing versus man's awareness of it. And so uh, oftentimes we're not very much aware of what God is doing. That doesn't mean God isn't doing it. Okay? So the church begins on the day of Pentecost, but it's later that God really reveals fully to Paul what's going on. And I think there was a practical reason for that. On the, on the day of Pentecost, uh, every believer in Christ that we know of was a Jew. They believed in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. There were no Gentiles yet brought in. And as late as Acts chapter 10, uh, we have really no Gentiles coming into the church. 
But think about what happened in Acts chapter 10 when Peter was sent to the household of Cornelius. And there's Peter down in Joppa on the roof of uh, Simon the Tanner's house. And in order to convince Peter to go to the Gentiles, God gives him this great vision of these unclean animals. And God gives Peter a direct command. Peter, arise, slay, and kill. And can you imagine Peter hearing directly from God his voice from heaven? He said, no, Lord. <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time even imagining uh, hearing an audible voice from God telling him to do something and saying, no. <laughs> and here is Peter, the apostle, telling God, no, I'm not going to do it. And so God shows him the vision three times before uh, thick-headed Peter is convinced that he needs to do something contrary to his own personal expectations. It took that to get Peter to go to the Gentiles. And I, I, I rather think, and I, I don't have a, a, a clear teaching of scripture on this, but this is kind of what I suspect is going on in the early days of the church, that if Jesus had told his disciples, on the day of Pentecost, the church is going to begin, and you're going to start going to the Gentiles and telling them how to get saved, that they all would have acted like Peter did in Acts 10. They would have said, don't worry, we don't want to do that. Okay. They were very willing to go to the Jews and tell them that, you know, hey, salvation is in Jesus. You believe in Jesus, and it will be salvation, it will be wonderful, and maybe the kingdom can come. They were filled with enthusiasm. But uh, this bit about the Gentiles, it took the church a little while to grow to the point of maturity to where they could, they could accept that. And so God revealed that aspect of what the church was really all about for Paul later on. That doesn't mean the church didn't begin on the day of Pentecost, but a matter of motivation for those early disciples. So I think that the whole dispensation of fails to distinguish between God's administration and man's awareness of it. Secondly, uh, ultra dispensation has a failure to understand the relationship of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the formation of the church. We talked about that in earlier lessons. And then thirdly, um, the danger of ignoring the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper is sort of the problem for ultra dispensationalism. Now, the second uh, form of um, uh, dispensation is different from ours, is what's known as progressive dispensationalism. And when we talk about this, we need to understand a little bit about the background. This is a fairly recent development. But uh, um, progressive dispensationalists, you know, we've talked a lot in previous lessons about the differences between dispensationalism and the covenant. You know. These differences are real, and they have resulted in some rather heated debates among the two groups. Okay. And at times, the disagreement between dispensationalists and covenant theologians has become strident and vociferous and loud, and somewhat negative. So a group of dispensational scholars who were involved in the Evangelical Theological Society were, were frequently um, uh, in association with other Evangelical Christians who were covenant theologians thought this is not a good thing. You know, the Bible calls us to be at peace with all men. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So in this effort to establish a more peaceful atmosphere of discussion and to promote uh, dialogue with others, uh, these dispensational scholars came together to try to, try to find a, a compromised position that would allow further discussion. And what came out of that was this position known as progressive dispensationalism. It began in um, the 1980s, and uh, the first public unveiling of this position came in 1986 at the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society in a group that still continues to meet each year called the Dispensational Study Group. Now, the leaders of this movement, there were three of them at the time. Number one, Daryl Bach. Daryl Bach is a New Testament scholar, research professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he has specialized especially in 
study of blue in ants. <coughs> he's become a very well-known scholar. He's even uh, interviewed by major news uh, sources when they want to find an evangelical scholar. Um, secondly, there is Craig Blazing. Uh, Blazing used to teach at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's now provost and executive as vice president at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. The third leader of this movement was Robert Sosey, who recently died March 12th of this year. And uh, he was distinguished professor of systematic theology at Talbot School of Theology from 1989, and was very active in uh, both dispensations and evangelical scholarship uh, long before that time. So uh, these came up with this kind of hybrid form of dispensationalism known as progressive dispensationalism, which is characterized especially by three points. Number one, uh, they have a present Davidic reign of Christ. <coughs> this is the first problem with progressive dispensationalism and the chief problem. Secondly, they wanted to maintain a greater continuity Israel and the church. And then thirdly, uh, we find in progressive dispensationalism a departure from a consistently literal interpretation of the Bible. And I want to take a look briefly at each of these three points in the time we have remaining. With regards to a present Davidic reign of Christ, um, this is really the main controlling feature of progressive dispensationalism. And it is the claim that Christ's Davidic rule began at the ascension. Now traditionally in dispensationalism, we, we see the Davidic reign of Christ beginning at the second coming of the kingdom. It's entirely future. But these uh, theologians said no, uh, the, the, the Davidic reign of Christ began at the ascension. Now what they do is they divide the Davidic reign of Christ into two phases. They say there is an initial phase, a present phase, which they call the inaugurated kingdom. And then a future completed phase, which comes at the second coming of Christ. But what they're doing is they're trying to find, I guess, common ground between dispensationalism and covenant theology by uniting what my mind here can't be united. But the chief way in which they do this, remember we, we talked about Darrell Bach being a specialist in Luke and Acts. So Darrell Bach uh, has written about Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And he is convinced that Peter was saying that the Davidic rule of Christ began at the ascension of Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, what Peter did was he quoted from both Psalm 132, verse 11, which is about the Davidic rule of Christ. He also quoted from Psalm 110, verse 1, which has to do with the ascension of Christ. And what Bob says is that Peter consciously and purposely linked these two uh, Old Testament passages together to say that the Davidic rule of Christ began at the day of Pentecost, or on the, on the uh, uh, at the Ascension. Uh, so here it is, and I've got them up here side by side. Uh, so Psalm 132, the Lord has sworn to name the truth from which you will not turn back, and the fruit of your body will set upon your throne. Psalm 110 says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a foot stool for your feet. The box says, since uh, Psalm 132, 11 says, um, I will set upon your throne. And Psalm 110 verse 1 says, sit at my, at my right hand. That Peter took that word set and sit and used the same word in both those verses to link them together in, uh, in, uh, in a, uh, a methodology used by uh, Jewish rabbis. Okay? So uh, the problem is and I've written extensively on Peter's uh, sermon here in Acts chapter 2, these two verses are cited in different parts of Peter's sermon. 
And he's talking about different things. If you look at Peter's sermon, you know, in verse 30 it says, And so, because of the prophet, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see the dead. Quote from Psalm 16. So Peter is saying, you can't have a dead Messiah ruling as king. In order for Christ to rule as the divinity king, he's got to be raised from the dead. And it says, see, he's been raised from the dead. So he's the one who's our Messiah. Then he goes on to say, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we're all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And notice that verse 33 begins with the word therefore, at least in our English translation. It's a tiny word in Greek, but it's an important conjunction. The word in Greek is pronounced un, un. And Peter uses it as an this is demonstrable in his sermon. Peter uses it as what's called a discourse shift marker. He moves from one section of the sermon to the next by using this word boom. What we have in verse 33 is not really an inference. It's not really therefore. It's more like now to the next topic of my sermon. And it's this. Having been exalted to the right hand of God, that's the ascension, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your seat. So Peter now, in verse 33, moves to the next section of the sermon, which talks about the ascension and the Melchizedekian rule of Christ as a priest. So he's talked about Christ as king, now he's talking about Christ as a priest. Now these two citations, one from Psalm 132, the other from Psalm 110, are not linked together. They're talking about different topics, and Daryl um, Boxing has not recognized this. Furthermore, Bob tries to take uh, the word set in verse 11 and link it with the word sit at verse 1. They're actually different words in the original. So they sound similar, they have kind of synonymous, but they're not exactly the same word. So there, there are problems with this idea. Uh, and this whole teaching of Christ's present uh, position at the right hand of God is a divinic reign. is all, all goes back to this passage right here. So the foundation is faulty, and the teaching falls apart, and what we have uh, traditionally said about the Davidic reign of Christ is correct, as Davidic reign does not begin until the second coming. Um, a second point here is that in progressive dispensationalism, they like to see a greater continuity between Israel and the church. Well, this has been one of the big problems that covenant theologians have always had with dispensationalism. Covenant theologians despise the fact that we say that the church is not Israel. And as we've seen, they go to great lengths to try to prove that the church is the true Israel of God. And that Israel in the Old Testament was the Old Testament church. They want to have a continuity all tied together by the covenant of grace. Well, progressive dispensationalists likewise want to have the church and Israel have a greater continuity, one of the same entity than one people of God. Well, it makes sense that they want to have the present position of Christ be a Davidic rule, right? If Christ's Davidic rule is over the church, then you've got to have the church somehow closer, more closely related to Israel. Because Christ's Davidic rule is described in the Old Testament as being a rule over Israel. So this is what they do. Uh, but dispensationalism has a traditionally made a lot out of the fact that the church is a heavenly people, Israel is an earthly people. Not meaning that Israel is anyway second grade or second class, but you know, I started out this, this hour with the quote from Philippians, which says that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await eagerly a saint of the Lord Jesus. That's where our citizenship is. But Israel's promised citizenship is in the earth of the kingdom with the geographical boundaries of the covenant of Abraham. And Israel's blessed hope is that God will regather them from worldwide dispersion, bring them 
back into the land at the coming of the Messiah to establish his rule and reign. There is a distinction between Israel and the church. But in order for progressive dispensation to drive, point, drive home its point about the present Davidic rule of Christ, they have to see a greater continuity and agree basically with the uh, covenant theology that there's not that big of a difference between Israel and the church. It's just one people of God. Which really uh, causes them problems when it comes to their description of what's going on in the Millennial Kingdom as well. We don't have time to get into that. Let me come to uh, the third point about progressive dispensation. And what allows them to come to these conclusions is their approach to hermeneutics of the, the interpretation of the scripture. And they have to adopt a, uh, a non-literal interpretation of some portions of the scripture. Now, they say that it's a literal interpretation, but they only do that by kind of redefining hermeneutics. And they adopt what they call a complementary hermeneutic. And uh, just to kind of sum that up, what uh, this complementary hermeneutic of uh, progressive dispensation of these things is that promises made to Israel in the Old Testament can be expanded and applied to another people <coughs> named the church applying it in a way that was different from the way it was originally intended. As long as it's interpreted that way by the apostles, or reinterpreted by the apostles, and as long as the original promise to Israel is not canceled. So they say the promise of a Davidic throne can now apply not just to a throne in Jerusalem, but to a throne in heaven as well. And the descendants of David can also include others that are of the seed of Abraham, believers, and so the church can be brought in, and that kingdom can be a non-literal kingdom, kind of a spiritualized kingdom in the present day. And they refer to the present so-called Davidic rule as an, an uh, already, but not yet, kingdom. And that was a, a phrase that was first employed by George Melvin Ladd, who was a covenant theologian, who believed in a post-tribulation rapture, and uh, the rest of dispensationists have simply borrowed uh, a lot of concepts from covenant theology, trying to mix them together with dispensation. I would say that the majority of people who call themselves dispensationalists today have actually bought into progressive dispensation, and that's a sad thing, especially on uh, college and university and seminary campuses. So as we as we close today, let's uh, try to give a, a summary evaluation. On the positive side, we can certainly say this, that uh, progressive dispensationalists have sought peace. Um, and we are told to speak the truth in love. Um, okay. And we acknowledge that and we admire people who want to be peaceful. That's good, but there are problems. And there are times when we have to maintain doctrinal truth. So on the negative side, um, what they do is they, they rob us of any clear rationale for a pre-tribulational rapture. If the kingdom is already present, there is no, uh, there's no rationale why God should catch the church out of the world before the tribulation period. Now to this day, my knowledge, there have been no uh, leaders of this movement that have adopted a post-tribulation rapture position. Most of them continue to teach dispensational schools, and so they're required to, uh, to agree to the doctrinal position of the school. So they, they claim that they are pre-tribulational approach from the rapture, but they not to make a big deal out of the rapture. It's not an important part of the teaching of any of these progressives that I've encountered. And uh, some of their followers actually have, uh, have dabbled in post-tribulation rapture theory. So that's that's one of the problems. There is no, uh, there's no rationale for a pre-trib rapture. If Israel, the church, has great continuity for the people of Israel, and Christ is already ruling. Secondly, uh, they have a problem 
with this issue of cessation of miraculous sign gifts. Because the Davidic kingdom is a time of great miraculous healing. And if that is true of the Davidic kingdom, and the church is uh, already exhibiting a, a kind of early inaugurated form of that kingdom, they would expect these miraculous gifts to be experienced in the church. And many progressive dispensationalists have taken this route along with um, the columnists and are talking about miraculous sign gifts being relevant for the church today. And it comes right out of this idea that we're already in the kingdom, at least in some sort. So these two areas are problems of progressive dispensationalism. Um, you need to be aware of this. It's very, very popular teaching today. But they deny the, the basic sine qua non defined by Ryan. Uh, they deny the essential distinction between Israel and the church. That problem comes to a, a literal interpretation of the Bible. And even when it comes to the basic purposes of God, they're more keyed in towards God's redemptive purposes and come to grace than they are in the matter of the glory of God and finding the purposes of God. Okay, so let's uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dismissed. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity once again to look into these matters. We pray that you help us to be lovers of your word, lovers of our Lord, those who are enthusiastic about sharing the gospel in a lost and dying world, and those who are interested uh, passionately in the blessed hope of the church, the soon coming of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you.